taken a step back in terms of how we feel about money and what we think money is and what how we represent it, let's look at some of that mm -hmm. and really talk about that. So we want money, but we don't actually want the money itself. We want what we think money can get us. Essentially, as human beings, we want to be happy. We want to live happy, balanced life. That is our natural way of being. Mm -hmm. But what we've managed to do is tangle up this whole aspect of money and what we think it can give us with ourselves, with our own self-persona, with our own um, self-esteem and self-confidence. So what we have to do is really untangle that, dismantle, you know, take that money out of the equation and separate it from ourselves and who we think we are. So as African people, we know um, a lot of, many of our um, ancestors were enslaved. Um, from the 1400s, and I would say we're probably we're still enslaved now. Mm -hmm. But we were forcibly enslaved for lots of different reasons. But one of the reasons was our labour. Yes. Yeah. So we were transported from our homeland into the Americas, predominantly into the Caribbean, and we were forced to work for our physical labour. With the onset of the um, industrial revolution. When machines were introduced, our labor wasn't needed in the same way. Yeah, so one woman could do the work of a hundred men mm -hmm. or a hundred women. So we were transported from the field to the factories because that's where they needed our labor next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we were, we were freed in inverted commas to do this because it was a different time. And what the industrial revolution required was people to buy goods that were produced. Mm -hmm. So we were then freed, if you like, from being chattel slaves into being um, debt slaves almost, or wage slaves. So you're saying from chattel slavery to debt slavery? From debt slavery to wage slavery, and I'll talk about how debt is created as well later on. So we were transported so that, they, you know, they, they had factories that producing all these goods, the cars, pots and pans, and, and they needed people to buy them. And they realized that if you, you know, employed people, gave them, you know, a minimum wage, just enough to keep them coming back, that they would still use that wage to buy goods and services from, you know, from themselves. Yes. Yes? So we were, like I said, transported into that. We're now in a stage, we're in the information age, where now technology is taking care of lots of the things that, we were transported to do. So we were transported from the field in the south to the north in the Americas, from the Caribbean to um, Europe, you mm -hmm. know, for many of us to fill these roles. Now these roles are no longer needed because, like I say, you know, you can get a machine to do, again, the work of a hundred men. You know, you can computerize lots of um, services and lots of, um, you know, production so we don't, we're not needed now. So we are an excess, if you like, to the system. And there was a book written in, um, I think, 1970 by a guy called Sidney Wilhelm. Mm -hmm. And it was called What Use is the Negro Now? Because he said, well, you know, we've really outlived our usefulness. Yes. Well, black people, African people have outlived their usefulness. So now our, useful, our usefulness for the system is, you know, to populate prisons, you know, populate mental institutions, or they will educate a few of us to run their businesses. So global white supremacy is a system, yeah? And the system, the acronym for system is save yourself time, energy, and money. And what global white supremacy has done has become more and more refined over the years, yes? Mm -hmm. So now we are still, in, you know, we're still used for our employment because we're keeping you know, prisons, in, you know, prison officers employed, you know, building for prisoners, um, the legal system, you know, we're keeping that going. I was recently in Atlanta and um, a judge was, a black woman judge, female judge, was speaking on the panel and she was saying that she was part of a committee and at that committee, they had already, you know, had information that they were saying that from the age of seven, they counted the number of black males in schools, yes, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and they had already planned how many prison beds they were going to need for those seven-year-olds, or how many of those seven... So there were already contracts that were drawn up based on the number of seven-year-olds in school. Mm-hmm. There was already contracts drawn up for, the, you know, providing food for those prisoners. There was already contracts drawn up to provide, you know, how many prisons were going to be needed to be built. So what does this mean for black people in Britain?